so for one, like X-Men was not spiritual, but not religious. X-Men was religious and spiritual, but he went to church every Sunday, but he didn't think what went on in church was the important thing because he had this mystical experience when he was 16 or 17. He's riding a horse into a Bible study at this fundamentalist Baptist church as a kid off of his farm, a hard day of work at his farm. And all of a sudden his horse just stops and rears back and whinnies. And he looks up, he sees a bright light. He feels electricity coursing through his body. He feels himself lifted out of his body. And he says he sees God and he therefore never will doubt God again. This becomes an incredibly important spiritual experience for him. It's not happening in church. He's so captured by that experience that he's trying his whole life to meet other people who have had these kinds of ex direct experiences of God. Yo, my friends, welcome to another episode of Christian Podcast. My name is Beto Gudinho, and this is the only show in the entire universe where we go from blasphemous to divine each episode. Today, we want to talk about why does America love spirituality but hate religion in the broader sense, in the generic sense. And today we have a guest. Like you know, I love to have guests on the show. His name is Stephen Prothero, and he's a professor of religion in America at Boston University, an acclaimed scholar and the author of numerous books, including New York Times bestseller, Religious Literacy, and so many others. And that's one of the questions I also want to talk about. Like, why are there so many bestsellers in the world, specifically in America? But before we do that, let's welcome him to the show. Steven, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me, Beto. Awesome. Okay, let's kick us off with an emoji. All right, so let's go to the Belifo meter. And there we have it, the skeptical emoji. Okay, Steven, what's the idea <laughs> behind our the emoji is, today? <laughs> the idea is that scripture, whether it's Christian or otherwise, is literally true. I'm skeptical of that idea. Wow. Okay, that's profound right there. So why are you skeptical of, of that idea? I mean, what would that mean, first of all, like that scripture is literally true? Yeah, so that's the key word is literally, right? Like, mm. like in other words, that, I mean, because if you look at, say, Christian scripture, there's so many different genres inside it, right? There's poems, there's songs, there's there's uh, many biographies like the Book of Ruth, there's, there's Proverbs, there's historical sections, there's parables, like there's such different types of literature there. And similarly with like Hindu scriptures, there's philosophical scriptures, there's, there's epic scriptures that are like, you know, really long stories of war or stories of families split up and stuff like that. And I just think, I think so much uh, scripture is literature and literature is not really meant to be read literally, you know, like, mm -hmm. and, and by that, I mean, like, if it says something like, like it can never speak allegorically or can never speak in metaphor or whatever, you know, that kind of thing. Mm, wow. That's so good. Yeah. Cause I think, okay. So, I mean, you have a book right here. It's called God, the bestseller. And it kind of narrates the story of this man that, that, um, influence American religion um, by being the editor of so many books that you know, kind of became bestsellers themselves throughout the history of America, right? And pretty much like modern America. So that's already interesting because uh, I, I think I agree with you in that sense, you know, that there's more to words than just what's written. And I love that because I think even, you know, I, I remember one of my first episodes, I was talking to a... Um, um, couple of Jewish uh, people and they were talking about how a Jewish person interprets scripture and that there is a macro lens and a microscopic lens to interpreting. So even even one, not even one word, but one one digit, right, would mean something for them in a different way that it does for somebody that's reading it from a different context, right? And, and if you think of even like Chinese symbols, that they're, they're almost like figures that represent um, something rather than just a word that you can like read over. It's just more like, oh, this, this 
picture means something, right? So I love that idea. So uh, to kick us off, why don't you tell us a little bit about like that idea behind this author um, or editor that you discover and how you came about like discovering this this person, uh, X Men, right? And or XM, no X Men. X Men, yeah, X Men, yeah. Right. Uh, so tell us a little bit about that because I think you no, know, that will kind of like kick us off into like going deeper into why why is that mean for us? Um, maybe as Americans, and I say that uh, because I live here, but I'm a Mexican. But uh, <laughs> but just the influence of books in in even the taking of books as sacred. But let's let's go first with with your findings that you have right here with this man X Men. Yeah. So, gosh, so many questions there. I um, thanks so much for talking about this with me. <laughs> so, so you know, I just I I've been a professor of American religion for a long time, like for over 25 years, and mm. I had never heard of this guy. Um, but I got a phone call from someone who lives five minutes from my house. Turned out to be his daughter, and she wanted me to come over her house and look at his books. And so I I went over there and looked at them. And I sort of thought they would be like collections of books I'm often asked to look at in New England, which is like dusty old Bibles from the 19th century or hymnals from the early 20th century, like old books that don't have a lot of historical interest. But when I got there, almost all the books were from the 20th century, like the middle of the 20th century. They weren't that they weren't that old, um, relatively, you know. And the first book I pulled off the shelf was Stride Toward Freedom by Martin Luther King. That's his first book. It's about the Montgomery bus boycott. And that really, you know, in some ways really kicked off, you know, important chapters in the civil rights movement. And I opened it up and inside there is a letter from Coretta Scott King, Martin Luther King's wife. And it says, Dear Jean, thank you so much. And I'm paraphrasing here, but thank you so much for your support of my husband and his, his career as an author. Thank you for your contributions to peace and brotherhood in the United States. And and I'm just over there thinking I'm going to look at some books at somebody's house. And all of a sudden, here's this guy who has some connection to Martin Luther King. And then right next door to that book on the same shelf, there's the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous published in 1939. Like mm. this, like the, the sort of founding scripture of the AA. And I open that. It has an inscription from Bill Wilson, who's the author of that book. I mean, the the sort of co-editor of that book. And he has a similar thing. You know, dear Gene, thanks so much for being present at the beginning of AA. You were so important in the editing of uh, the big book. Thank you so much for your friendship. And so I just found five minutes from my house, this collection of books. Then I then I asked the family, like, do you have any papers? Because inside so many of these books, there were papers and letters and blah, blah, blah. And pretty soon, within a month or two, they were coming, they were calling me up every week or so. Come on over to the house. We found another box in the barn. Come on over to the house. We found another box in the attic. And by the but by the time that all happened, I had thousands and thousands of letters between him and his authors, many of whom all in religion, many of whom wrote best-selling books and who together had a really important and powerful influence on the course of American religious history. Yes. So that, I mean, it seems like you're very excited about this finding <laughs> in a sense, but at the beginning you were not. So, I mean, that's that strikes me as like, is that, do you think that was coincidence? Do you think that was almost like a, a divine appointment? How do you take it personally? <laughs> So, so here's the thing. This is okay. Now I started off as Mr. Skeptic emoji, you know, I think, you know, I just, I tend to be skeptical about these things, but I have to say, it's kind of hard for me to be skeptical about this one. And let, let me tell you, let me tell you why. Like, so one of the books, one of the books that I wrote that's used a lot in college classrooms is called God is not one. And it's, it's kind of a, uh, intro to all like major world religions. And I make this argument that the religions are really different. You know, this idea that a lot of people have, it's called perennialism, this idea that all the religions are the same, like they're only, they're only different in, in minor ways, like, but essentially they're basically the same. And that whole book I wrote is against that. But then I, I, I discover this archive. He's the guy who makes this idea famous. Like he just publishes all these books about how the world's religions are essentially the same. He's lived through World War I. He's lived through World War II. He doesn't want people to kill each other over religion. And he's really attracted this, to this idea that the religions should be seen as basically the same. And so one of the books he published is called The World's Religions by Houston Smith. It sold three and a half million copies. It's still used all the time in world religions classes in U.S. colleges and high schools. And 
that book makes this argument that, you know, the, all the world's religions are essentially the same. And so when I come across this and I figure out who this guy is, I did feel this weird feeling in the back of my neck, like, okay, so you've published this book on this, this idea. And here is the biggest archive you'll ever find that's exactly telling you you're wrong, you know? And I just thought that was really cool that it sort of fell in my lap and the whole, the whole thing was challenging uh, that particular idea that I had kind of hung my hat on in my own writing. Yeah, and five minutes away from your home. <laughs> that that seems very coincidental, right? I know, um, I know, exactly. And it's and it's also right in my specialty. Like my specialty mm. in my PhD is in American religious history. And I've mostly published like 19th and 20th century stuff. So it was like right in my wheelhouse. And then it was also a guy I never heard of. And I sort of felt like, why haven't you heard of this guy? Mm -hmm. And and there there was there is one scholar at University of Virginia, Matthew Hedstrom, who um wrote a chapter about him that I probably should have run across, but I hadn't run across when I when I found this archive. Right. And the other interesting thing is that this kind of uh this editor is became kind of like the um or the publishers that they were, it's basically the publisher you're publishing your books with, right? Nowadays. So I, I mean no, that's the other Yeah, that's the other weird coincidence is that <laughs> is that right so harper one is publishing this book right mm -hmm. but this guy he starts at harper in harper and brothers it's called in 1928 in new york they start the prior year they start this religious books division there's a lot of interest in publishing in religious books in the 20s so they start it and this guy who establishes it dies within one year they hire this guy x-men to run that division, which he does from 1928 to 1965. And he turns it into the number one publisher of religion books in the United States. And then over the course of time, like in the 70s, it moves to San Francisco and it gets called Harper San Francisco. And then a little bit after that, I think in the 2000s, I think it, it gets renamed Harper One. So basically my book is being published by like the great grandchildren of my guy, you know, like in the publishing yeah. house, not like actually his kids, <laughs> but like his predecessors, you know, his, not his predecessors, his, the people who follow after him are the ones who are publishing, who are publishing the book. Yeah. That's weird too. Wow. And, and, and not just that they're publishing it, but they were publishing my books before I found the archive. Mm -hmm. Right. So I had published four or five books for them before I even found the archive. So wow. yeah. Just, so what do you think? Uh, what emoji are you on for whether that's providence or whether that's coincidence? What do you think? Um, I, I'm like on holy emoji. <laughs> I think I'm, I'm in the when I think when I think of holiness, I think of like relationships. And yeah. I think there's something to that. And I don't know to what extent yeah. some people would say, you know, the universe is com conspiring in your favor or something like that. But yeah. uh, but I love this idea because. I think, in a sense, as humans, we're always looking, in Spanish, we say we're looking for el hilo negro de las cosas, so the, the black thread of things, which yeah. means, like, the meaning behind things, and why is this happening, yeah. right? And is this a coincidence? And you know, maybe Christians would say this is a godsidence, right? Like, this God made this happen. So, in that sense, I mean, it just brings me to think, like, why do we consider even, like, books sacred um, in And yeah, like what what would you say of that? Like as just as humans, why do we consider different? I um, mean, you're a professor in American in in religion in general, but um, why do people like find different scriptures to feel like this this has a sacred connection? What does that mean yeah. for humans? Yeah. So before I answer that, I got to add one more thing on your holy emoji and the yeah. whole coincidental thing, because X Men really believed in providence. He totally did. Mm. He wasn't skeptical. He had this mystical experience as a kid as a teenager. And then he really believed like he would in his own work, he would sort of wait on the leading of God. Like he would believe that God wanted something to happen in his life or with a certain book or whatever. And he had, he, and, and, and part of his religious practice was like silence, like sitting in silence or meditating. Um, and he really believed like when he was working on Martin Luther King's book, you know, he was talking about, okay, You're going to write this book and we're going to edit it, but the real person behind uh, the book is God. I forget what word he used for God. It was, um, I don't know, it, it wasn't higher power, but it, it, was, it was, you know, it was basically God. 
Um, so anyway, so that's another piece of the Hulk. Uh, and also, there's a family saying in his family still down, nothing, nothing happens without a reason. Mm. Like, there's a reason for everything that happens. And everybody in the family kept quoting that to me, you know, wow. um, and it was from him. So anyway, about sacred books. So X-Men thought they were books were sacred. He he wanted to be a missionary to China when he was in college. He actually got a job to go to uh, what was then Peking, now Beijing, to be a missionary. But he was convinced by his brother and his mother and some friends to stay back and go to Divinity School, go to University of Chicago Divinity School. And then when he got out, he got uh, he got this job offer and in religious publishing, and he talked to this minister friend of his, Baptist minister. And the guy said, listen, books can be a calling, like books can be a mission. You have so much influence over readers. And this is this is in the 20s, you know. And this is before, I mean, there is radio, but this is before TV. This mm -hmm. is before the Christian podcast. You know, this is before the internet, right? Um, and and so books at the time were really, really powerful. Mm -hmm. And of course, in the Protestant tradition, you know, in the Christian tradition, you know, the Bible is a sacred book, right? Um, the Bible has the knowledge of the tradition in it. It has the word of God in it. And so it has a sacred um you know, quality. And so it's not that far a leap. If you come from a tradition that sees the Bible, the text as sacred to see other, other religious texts, other Christian texts, you know, as not the same, obviously, but like having a call, like the, the capacity they can call to someone's soul, you know, mm -hmm. and X-Men, when he was living in New York city for over 20 years, he would have, he would meet with his a group of friends. It was usually like six, eight, 10 of them. And they would have dinner. They would sit in silence and they would talk about a book. And, and he urged people like buy a book, buy the book, like write it up, like write in the margins. I always do that. I always write in my books all the time. Like I, I have like this conversation with them. And so he certainly believed that. And, you know, I put that a quote from him at the beginning of, of the book, you know, that um, I, I, I forget what it was, is, but it's basically the idea that, you know, books are sacred. And, uh, and I think there's something true to that. You know, I, I love holding a book. I love reading a book. I love sitting down, having no distraction. Um, but I also think there's a really interesting connection that happens, not unlike a conversation like we're ha having now, but it's a conversation with someone who's not in the room. You know, mm -hmm. they're giving you what they're thinking and you're interacting with it and saying, yes, no, that doesn't make sense. Kind of, you know, being skeptical or, you know, believing it, whatever. Yeah. So I don't know. I think there's something to that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cause that, I think that's still in the same thread of like, we're, we're trying to discover like the meaning behind things and books speak to us in that sense. Right. And, and whether we agree or not with the author, it's like, we're, we're reading it because we're trying to find something in it. Right. We're reading it because, um, we, we almost like want it to influence us or speak to us in a sense. Right. And I love how you're saying that, um, X-Men had, uh, this, this, um, interaction about well you can almost like you can be a missionary of books because they can influence so many people and i think what you discover right as as, as this woman called you in 2013 i think uh to visit her house and and you eventually discover like this massive amount of books by one editor right to think all of the people his influence because of that editing process right And to think like, um, I love there's a phrase in the book where you say, I think in America, a lot of people would rather um, think their way to a new house or think their way to a new car, but they don't really make the effort to, you know, maybe like think about God. And, and I think almost that that's kind of like bringing me back to this idea when when there's so many religious books It's not just about you no know, one that one is Christianity, one is Hinduism, or like all these other religions, right? It's like people are trying to find meaning from all these um, different types of b scriptures, right? In a sense, just scriptures in general. And so the influence that those have on people, like why do you think people resonate so much with that idea of like I'm spiritual but not religious and but 
but then again, like there's all these massive books that people have read throughout you know, modern history in America about maybe religion in general, right? Like how, how is that connection between yeah. spirituality and 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 religion? Like are, are they are they really that different from one another? Yeah, that's good. I like the way you ask questions because you layer on top of each other. <laughs> to <try laughs> There's to so many them. questions. Right? But no, but it makes it makes the questions really interesting. Like, so, so for one, like X Men was not spiritual but not religious. X Men was religious and spiritual. Hmm. He was more spiritual, but he went to church every Sunday. I mean, he was active in his church. He was he was on the like board of you know, overseers or whatever it was in his church. He was on the music committee, you know, stuff like that. Like he was really active. His wife taught in Sunday school. Mm. Um, so he was religious and spiritual, but he didn't think what went on in church was the important thing. Cause mm. he had this, I mentioned it earlier. He had this mystical experience when he was 16 or 17, he's riding a horse into a Bible study at this fundamentalist Baptist church as a kid off of his farm, a hard day of work at his farm. And all of a sudden his horse just stops and rears back and whinnies. And he looks up, he sees a bright light. He feels electricity coursing through his body. He feels himself lifted out of his body. And he says he sees God and he therefore never will doubt God again. This becomes an incredibly important spiritual experience for him. It's not happening in church. It's happening with him out in front of a graveyard in his hometown. And the way I interpret his life is, He's so captured by that experience that he's trying his whole life to meet other people who have had these kinds of ex direct experiences of God. And he's sort of gathering them into what I call like a mystics club, like an informal mystics club that he can talk about. Them. What happened to you? Why do you think it happened to you? Has it ever happened again? Like, what do you think are the techniques for sitting and like waiting on God, listening to God so that God might visit you again with such an, such an experience? And then these people become his friends. And then he says, hey, why don't you write a book about your life? Or why don't I help you write a book uh, uh, about your life? And, and this is how the whole thing, this is how the whole thing happens. But he's really attracted as are almost all of his authors to mysticism, to like the direct individual personal encounter with God. And the churchy stuff, the stuff that happens in the church, like listening to a sermon, like doing the mass, doing the Holy Communion, that kind of stuff. He just doesn't think that that's that generative. It doesn't bring you that close. It doesn't bring you close to God in his view. And so, he and his friends, they have a critique of religion, you know, relig organized religion, institutional religion. You know, that's not really what it's about. Like, what was Jesus doing? He was like wandering around talking to people. He wasn't sitting in a, like a church, like, you know, preaching and, you know, doing the sacraments and stuff that that wasn't his thing. And so, so they all have this kind of criticism of organized religion. And then they have a high evaluation of individual spirituality. And then they're all kind of seeking after that. And, and that takes them in all different directions, right? It doesn't just take them to Christian stuff. It might take them to Hindu stuff. It might take them to Buddhist stuff. They don't really care because they think all the religions, there's one God and behind all the religions is that one God. And if you can get some technique from some Hindus to get you closer to God, that's great. And if you can get it from Buddhists, that's great. And if you get it from your Christian friends, that's great too. Mm -hmm. I answered like half of your question. Yeah, but, no, that's but so I'm good. Trying. I'm doing my best. <laughs> that's so good because I think I mean one. I would uh, this would be I don't know this the first time I ever do this in an episode. But I would say I kind of disagree when you said you know Jesus was out and about preaching or not really preaching but like being with people. I agree, but when I read scripture specifically, you know the 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 Bible right or the New Testament specifically I think in Luke, which I consider him, uh, I don't know, he would be one of my heroes as an author. Um, he says that Jesus visited the synagogue often, yes. right? And then he was there yeah. like every week and every week. You know, week yeah, week, yeah. Uh, you're right. You got me. You okay. got me. <laughs> got me no you're right Perfect. okay <laughs> no, you're right like right and the, right and and also i love luke too because it's in the gospel of luke that jesus cares about the poor right mm. in the gospel of matthew he's talking about the poor in spirit but in the gospel mm -hmm. of luke he's actually talking about the poor yeah um but yeah you're right yeah so he he went he 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 was uh he went to the temple he didn't live in jerusalem but he went to into jerusalem for the high holy days he went into the temple 
um, he was talking with, you know, rabbis and stuff there in the temple. And he was also, yeah, he was also going to synagogue. Um, and he was trained in the tradition. So, yeah, I think you're right. It, yeah, it's it's unfair to characterize him as a sort of freelance spiritual person, right? Mm. But um, but he's also he also is having experiences of the divine that aren't really happening in church, right? I mean, mm-hmm. so I mean, he's, yeah. So he's obviously like he's a tricky example because he's not just like the guys who X with his meeting, right? Sure, but, but um, I love the I love even XM's uh, story with with this horse because when you read you no know, Paul the apostle in. I think it's the book of Acts when he falls off the horse and then he hears this voice from heaven yeah. and it's Jesus and he says, why are you persecuting me? And then you see, and this is, this, uh, right now I'm kind of like in the heretical maybe emoji <laughs> for some people, but that's fine <laughs> because um, I'm going to go here right now. You know, I, I even read, um, what's his name? Rob Bell, right? And he's got a podcast yeah. called the Robcast or yeah, Robcast. And in one of those, he's talking about kind of like these mystical experiences. And he says, when you look at scripture, it, it seems to me like there's always um, a, a deeper understanding of who God is because of a mystical experience. So think of Peter, he's in the, in the, on that roof. And then it says that he had like this vision that says, you know, eat from this, this uh, food. And he's like, no, I'm not supposed to eat from that, that food because it's going to make me unclean. And, it's, and then God says, like, why do you call things unclean that I haven't called uh, unclean? And then this Roman officer visits him at that point, and now he, now he can see him as like, oh, okay, so this person is not unclean, right? Even though he's not a Jewish, I'm supposed to, like, welcome him. So And so on, right? I mean, Jesus had the transfiguration experience. The whole book of Revelation is basically a mystical uh, dream or experience. Yeah, so there's a yeah. lot to that um, to maybe just dismiss or avoid. But I love that idea of um, even people in church, right? Like XM was a perfect example because he attended church so often, right? But... He was also, and I, I'm saying this because I find like a lot of people nowadays, I feel like relate to this because they might attend church, but not necessarily ascribe to all the church's doctrines, right? And I think that happens again and again. I have friends who say, you know, I go to church, I love it, but uh, do I believe everybody goes to hell? No, I'm like, okay, I mean, you have your own personal theology that you know, kind of guides you. And even though I, I, I I'm... A little bit more inclined to believe that we we gotta come to like a I don't know if a, a sense of um, like agreeing upon what scripture means, right? Because uh, I'm very open to that. Like, well, if you interpret it differently, but at the same time, I feel like people believe what they believe anyways, right? <laughs> so in that sense, I feel yeah. like a lot of people are even attending church. Nowadays, whichever whichever tradition you would think, right? A Catholic, Methodist, a Protestant, and whatnot. And still, I think they, they're like, meh, this part of what I'm reading or what I'm being taught, I don't agree with. But wh- how did you, because when I think of America, like I remember when I was in Mexico hearing about this thing that happened in Waco, Texas, right? Yeah. With uh, David, um, David, yeah, David Koresh. Koresh. Right. Yeah. So this 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 idea and even when I think of maybe like the the idea of the religion of um later day saints or the Mormons, it's like to me it feels like very almost like a like an American made religion in a sense, like wow, isn't that curious? Like all these things happen here in America. It uh, is and it this is mystical made. experience. Uh so what do you think of that? Uh people finding like these experiences, but maybe taking them to the extreme where I mean, would you ever agree with with somebody that says, "Oh, I think what we got to commit here is like a massive suicide"? Like, how do people get to those places? Yeah. So, so see, that's the trick about this the mystical idea, right? Mm-hmm. That you know, as soon as you can, and it's been throughout American history, this has been an issue. Like going in colonial, like colonial New England, this is an issue. Like, if you if you are trying mm-hmm. to have either a Christian community or like a society that's biblically based like like a lot of the new england colonies were doing um and then you have people who say actually you know what i know we've all voted on this law and we think it's based on scripture but actually god just talked to me last night Mm -hmm. and god said this other thing 
So yeah. I'm not going to do that anymore because God just talked to me, right? So they have this authority that's straight from God, which in some ways is should be like more important than the governor of Massachusetts, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and similarly, you know, in Catholicism, right, you have like Our Lady of Guadalupe, you know, like who, you know, shows up and talks to people, right? And and gives them information and gives them like guides to action, right? Mm-hmm. But then there's other people who, I don't know, maybe they're mentally unstable and they're thinking that, uh, you know, Virgin of Guadalupe is appearing to them, you know, who knows? Um, and so, yeah, I agree. It's really tricky. And the David Koresh thing, that was really, I was in graduate school when that happened. And that was really formative for me because I was watching that whole thing happen in Waco, Texas with when the FBI came in and they end up burning down that, that um, compound. And he was like reading the seven seals of the book of revelation and all this stuff in this very idiosyncratic way. And I remember thinking like, man, this is going to be really bad. And, um, I actually, like, I wanted to call the FBI. I write about this in one of my books, in my religious literacy book. Wow. It's like, I wanted to call the FBI because I said, listen, I know what's happening. Like, he wants you to attack the building. Hmm. He wants you to put it on fire because that's, like, fulfilling his idea of the seven seals in the book of Revelation. Like, that's what he wants. Like, don't do that. Like, don't. But I'm a graduate student. I'm thinking, like, what do I do? Call, like, 1-800-FBI? Like, how do you even... <laughs> You call yeah. the FBI, you know, but it was really chilling for me to watch it and say, mm-hmm. I know what's going to happen and then watch it happen like a couple of days later, like exactly what I was thinking um, was happening. And yeah, and, and there's a guy who's getting direct information from God, right? He's getting like, mm-hmm. you know, maybe mystical experience. Now, the thing about X-Men and his friends that what they do with that is they say, listen, you can have a mystical experience, but what does it do to you? Like, does it make you a better person? Does it mm. make you fight against war? Does it make you work for justice? Like, and he was very keen that mysticism isn't just about this private information. It isn't just about like sitting around and navel gazing and like just doing private like spirituality. Like it should always take you out into the world mm. in, in that kind of Luke kind of way. It should take you out in the world to like care for um, justice and, and peace and that kind of stuff. And if it doesn't, you have to really question whether it was a genuine encounter with God. Wow, that's so good. Because even uh, uh, one of the other books you mentioned is the the double A book, right? What they call the big book. And for a lot of people, maybe they even consider that a sacred book. But in, in the general sense, I feel like society was undergoing um, like massive... Uh, I don't know how to describe it, but they were... Let's just say everybody was getting drunk, you know, beyond... Beyond even their their uh, self, what is it? I'm missing the word. It's almost like um, it takes over you, like you have no control, right? So no yeah. out of control. You're losing your self control. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So no yeah. self control when it comes to alcohol, right? And and there comes this book, and people trying to help the other people overcome this this addiction to alcohol, right? And being not an alcoholic. And in a sense, I, I see that that trend that you're saying, you know, that this book helps so many people overcome that. So you, we, I think most people would see that as a good thing, right? Oh, it's for the benefit of the majority. So with taking that idea to maybe nowadays, do you see any, any uh, maybe societal issues that we are undergoing where something like the big book was for people, you know, 50, mm. 60 years ago, we're gonna need something like that in in our you know in the in the first part of the 21st century. <laughs> that's that's a good one. That's a good one because you know when the big book came out in 1939, there had been prohibition and prohibition in, you know kept alcohol supposedly away, and then that was lifted. Um, and that was a real it was a huge social problem, and and the book of AA really push people like you need, you need higher power, you know, like you, mm. it can be, it doesn't have to be Christian God. It has to be like, but it has to be God and you can call it whatever you want. And, and so they call the higher power. I think, I don't know. I mean, I'd love to know what you think, Beto, but I, I would say, I think, I think the whole thing with everybody on their phones is mm. really making for a kind of a lot of social isolation and that so much of people's lives are lived um just you know looking at pixels on a screen instead of looking at other people i remember mm-hmm. the very first time i saw someone in public with a cell phone 
they were walking. It was a mother. She was walking through a park with her daughter and she was looking at her phone, like, like fiddling with her phone. And the kid kept pulling on her dress, like mommy, mommy. Mm. And she, she, she wouldn't look over at her own kid. Like she was just so um, obsessed with the screen and the, the screens are addictive. Mm -hmm. And um, I think they're more addictive than alcohol probably. And so I would say one of the challenges is how do you get people to interact with one another, to talk with one another, like you and I are talking now and to, to listen to one another and to like see the world instead of just seeing what some computer programmer has designed to deliver to them through their, their phone. So that would be my, my thought. What do you think though? Well, Let's I think, think, yeah, no, I think I agree, completely agree. And I think that's the, that's the idea maybe behind uh, addictions that when, when it came to alcoholism, it was more like evident and, you know, it kind of like took over your senses. So there was a way to say, okay, that's definitely wrong. Right. But when it comes to social media interaction and phones and screens, I think, uh, I think maybe the, our, there's something in our minds that sees it as wrong, but not as evidently wrong not as like oh that's an addiction or that's uh you know it's making you behave differently or something like that right uh it's taking over your senses so in a sense it is but we don't see it like that because it, it's not it doesn't look so bad and especially yeah. nowadays that everybody's so used to it so to your question i think you know if if we go all the way back to these coincidences and you find in this library I would say, wow, maybe you are to write the next big book on, I don't know if it's going to be social media, because there's a lot of that, but um, I'm, I'm not going to offer you the answer. I'm just going to say, maybe you are the one that's <laughs> going to write the next big book. <laughs> wow. Wow. That's heavy. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to pull out the skeptical emoji about that too, <laughs> but maybe, maybe uh, we'll see. We'll okay. See. All right, we'll see for sure. Okay, so this is what we're going to do to end the episode, Steven. This has been so good. And now we're going to go to our emojis to summarize the episode or even just to think of the future. Okay, so as we go over the five emojis, we're going to start with blasphemous. And the question is, in the type of work that you do or even when we consider American religion and spirituality what would be the most blasphemous idea the most far-fetched that you can think that's out there i would say for me i mean for me i mean it's tricky but i would say for me the most blasphemous idea would be that you know god has somehow chosen the united states as his people and i think that that is blasphemous because it leads people to it leads people to follow their culture instead of to follow their religious ideas or their ideas of truth. Um, and I think it's been proven even in recent years to be very dangerous. So I would say that. Wow. You know, that we're yeah. like the best country on earth and God picked us and um, therefore we can't do any anything wrong. That's what I would say. Oof, there's a lot to that, man. And I would love to hear people's comments on that. But let's move on to the next one. <laughs> skeptical emoji. Why are you still skeptical of or where do you see skepticism played out? You know, I think young people are really skeptical of Christianity. Um, you know, I think part of it, it's related to my first point. That Christianity has become so politicized and it's become associated with more right-wing politics and... Um, and a, that's a lot of people, you know, you look at surveys, there's a lot of surveys that um, young people are disaffiliating. They don't want to call themselves Christian as much as they used to. And they, they, it feels intolerant to them. Mm -hmm. And so I think, I think we see that skepticism playing out in the, in American culture today with young people. Wow. That's so good. And would, uh, just a question, would you consider yourself Christian or no? <laughs> tell me what it means and then i'll tell you yes or no awesome let's move to the next emoji <laughs> inspired emoji where do you see inspiration what gives you hope wow i have a lot you know 
The natural world gives me hope. When I see people out, out and about, when I see people looking up at the sky at birds, when I see people hiking, mm. um, that's inspiring for me. It's inspiring. Again, it's related to getting away from your cell phones and stuff. You know, I find that mm. really inspiring. Just being out in nature, you know, it's beautiful. Uh, mm. Is that is that a coincidence? You know? Yeah. Maybe not. Wow. Yeah. Maybe that's where you will have your own mystical experience to write that big book. Next one is holy emoji. What would you consider a holy idea? Man, a holy idea. I would say um, that every human being is is precious, and that we shouldn't we shouldn't think that some humans are are better than others because of their education or their race or the language they speak or their religion. Wow, qué bonito dijo. Qué bonito. I'm feeling like uh, I'm feeling. <laughs> this is hard, man. This is hard. I love it. Okay, <laughs> last one is divine. I mean, what would you consider a divine idea? <laughs> oh man, they get harder. They get harder. <laughs> That's the easier. last one. <laughs> easier on the on the left side of your emoji emoji list. <laughs> um. You know, I just think, I think this is where I, I, I go with the mystics. I just, I think that we can't speak of the divine. Like, I just think, I think we are always at risk of, of blasphemy whenever we speak of the divine, you know? Um, there's reasons why in the Jewish tradition, there's taboos against even saying the name of God. Wow. So, so I'm going to say, what's divine? Like, is like silence because you got to be careful what you say when it comes to God. That was so good. Steven, this has been an amazing conversation. <laughs> this has been so profound. You know, thank you for being on the show. I would love for you to know, point people maybe to your resources or you know where they can find your God, the bestseller book. Yeah, so I'm at uh, on Twitter, S. Prothero, and uh, that's kind of where I am on social media. And then, yeah, my book is available at bookstores on the 14th of March and online and all that stuff. And uh, yeah, I have a website, stephenprothero.com, S-T-E-P-H-E-N, prothero.com. I got some stuff, information there. Love. But nothing as good as not, nothing as good as Beto's, you know, Christian <laughs> podcast. That's for sure. Uh, well, that's right because you guys can go to christianpodcast.com. This conversation will be right there in depth with links to everything else. And I would ask or request this of you, my friends, if you like this episode, like it, subscribe, rate it, five or more stars, please, no less than that. <laughs> Otherwise, go listen to something else. <laughs> And uh, share it with a friend, right? Visit us at christianpodcast.com. Check out our emojis and belief meter. I'll see you guys on the next one. Mm -hmm.